Good evening. Welcome to our last periodic tables of calendar 2019. Very excited for Tina Coyne Smith, and I'll introduce her in a moment. First, I want to tell you about next month. Uh, we're going to meet on Tuesday, January 14th, and our speaker is going to be Yusuf Zafar from Duke Oncology, who um, <clears throat> I don't think it's a dubious honor, uh, but he helped coin the term financial toxicity uh, for people not able to pay for health care, and his topic is going to be Can't Buy Me Health. Um, so uh, he's very excited, and we're very excited to have him since there's a lot of discussion about health care and drug prices in the air. Okay, um, so Tina Coyne Smith is a stargazer and space historian who was born just after Apollo 9 proved the success of the lunar module. She was forever captured by the gravity and magic of Project Apollo. She serves as a NASA JPL solar system ambassador who is tasked with telling NASA's stories. And one of her areas of expertise is the Apollo moon mission. Um, and prior to uh, her current job in development at UNC, she taught literature, grammar, and writing, and currently she speaks at schools, museums, and community events about myriad topics in space exploration. She told me this will be her 52nd presentation on Apollo this year. So please welcome Tina Coyne-Smith. Thank you very much. I'm so pleased to be here. This is a great year to talk about Apollo. I have a loud voice, so I'll try not to blow you all away with that. Um, this is my 50-second talk, which is pretty good for a volunteer gig. I am a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador that is a volunteer position that is tasked with going into the community and talking about various topics in space exploration. Apollo is my favorite. I have read about Apollo literally since I was a small child. I love it so much. My 11-year-old is here tonight, and he, he's very happy and not embarrassed for me to tell you that his middle name is Apollo, named after the space program. Um, the idea is that we can really do anything we put our minds to, anything at all. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So Apollo, how do we even get to Apollo? Okay. In the early 1960s, President John F. Kennedy is trying to win the space race related to the Cold War. And he makes a promise, September 12, 1962, at Rice University, that we are going to get to the moon. And we're going to do it because it's hard, and we're going to win. That's what he says. One problem, we have no idea what we're doing. We don't have the technology. We don't have the capability. All we know is that we want to beat the Russians in the space race. This is what we want to do. And so what happens to make that happen? Okay, we can't do it. It's an impossible thing at this point in history in 1962. Well, we come up with a number of steps for what we need to do to land man, and it was man at this time, there were no female astronauts, I'll come back to that in one moment, um, to land man on the moon. And the first thing we do is we create Project Mercury. Project Mercury is a project that figures out can humans survive in space? Can we send, can we shoot humans into space, keep them alive, get them back? Project Mercury is the first step. We then have Project Gemini. Now instead of shooting one man into space, we're gonna shoot two, and we're gonna answer the questions, can we live in space? Can we work in space? Can we fly in space? Can we connect things together in space? All while staying alive and getting people back home. Gemini is the second step in getting people to the moon. The real part of getting people to the moon comes with Project Apollo, okay? And so Project Apollo, the entire point, the whole mission of Apollo, is to land a man on the moon and bring him safely back to Earth. And so what are the steps needed to do that, right? We need spacecraft, we need equipment that can launch us out, that can keep us alive in space, that can carry us to the moon, 
that can then land us on the moon that we can get off of the moon with back to a spacecraft, back to Earth, and land safely, all while keeping the precious cargo inside alive. And so Project Apollo is a series of missions, each one in an iterative state, that does just exactly that. And so what we're going to do tonight is to go ahead and to talk about each iterative piece that got us to the moon, what happened on each mission, and then we're going to show some pictures. Part of the best part of this is some of the pictures taken by the astronauts in each of these missions. Um, and then we'll end up with some time at the end for questions if we just kind of want to talk about Apollo. And so, you know, the first thing is the launch vehicle and the spacecraft. We need machinery to make this happen. It doesn't exist. We don't have rockets that can escape Earth's gravity with the kind of cargo that it's going to take to get to the moon. We don't have things that can keep humans alive in space, all right? We tend to think of this as a spacesuit. This is really called a portable life support system in, in the NASA world because it is exactly that. It, this is a spacecraft that our astronauts wear on their bodies to keep them alive in space. That doesn't exist. We need to invent that. We need a rocket, okay? So the Saturn V is the rocket that does eventually launch the spacecraft we need to the moon. It is created by Werner von Braun. I have a model here for any young people in the house who want to play with this afterwards. It comes apart and I can show it to you. We can do that. Um, it has seven and a half million pounds of thrust, which is what it takes to get all the components off of Earth's gravity on the way to the moon. That's what it looks like. And so the way the rocket works is this. It's done in stages. We'll come back to that one perhaps. Because I want to show you this. This is the whole rocket, 33 stories tall. That's the part the humans are in. That's the only part that's eventually going to come home, the command module, okay? And so um, three parts, we have the command module. Just underneath it, we have the lunar module, which is the part that's going to land on the moon. And then there's a service module in here, and we'll show you some part pieces of all of that. Let me see if I have the picture of all of them. Okay, so here we go here. This is the command module right there. It holds three astronauts. This is the service module. This contains everything needed, um, electricity, fuel cells, everything needed to service the command module. And this is the lunar module. This is the part that's going to disconnect and go to land on the moon. And so all of these things need to be invented. They need to be created in order to make this work. What I passed by is the way that the Saturn V works, okay? And so the Saturn V is done in stages. All of this is fuel, stage one, stage two, stage three. Stage one, the rocket launches. After several minutes, all of this falls away. It's fuel, it's used up to get enough lift to continue to go up, falls back to Earth. This is all fuel, it burns away. Stage two eventually falls back to Earth. Stage three, inside of here, is the lunar module. And what happens here is that it opens up, the command module separates, turns around, docks with the lunar module, pulls this thing out of the third stage here of the rocket. This then goes away, falls away, so that what you end up with, here's another picture of it, turning around, pulling it out, this is then what goes on its way to the moon. Looks just like that. The astronauts are here in the command module. When it's time for them to go to the moon, they transfer to the lunar module. Apollo has three astronauts. One of them stays behind in the command module, which orbits the moon, while the other two astronauts go into the lunar module to land on the moon. When their work is finished on the moon, this lunar module, I think you can see it here a little better, has an ascent stage and a descent stage. Once the whole thing lands on the moon, and it will land, this, these are the feet that land on the moon. Once it lands on the moon, the astronauts will do their work on the moon. They will get back into the lunar module. They will climb to the top of it. That is the ascent stage. It has um, it has a propulsion system. They will light that. They actually don't light it. It's it mixes fuels to take off. And the top part of the lunar module launches back into space. It meets up with the command module 
which is going around the moon. They hook up again, doc and rendezvous, rendezvous and docking, and then they come back to Earth. When they get closer to Earth, they jettison the entire lunar module. They eventually jettison the entire service module so that the command module is the only part that returns to Earth. And so that's how the rocket works. This is the lunar module on the moon. You can see here, you can see the ascent stage and the descent stage. And we'll go through and we'll talk about each of the missions and what it tested, okay? And so the first mission is Apollo 1. This is, of course, the very tragic mission. I will mention that the astronaut patches for each mission, which I've included on these slides, and I have some examples here if anybody'd like to see them afterwards, are fantastic. We could do a whole study of simply astronaut patches and Apollo patches. They're beautifully done with the astronaut names in most cases, not all. And there's iconography that tells you what the mission was about. And we'll talk a little about that as we go on. Apollo 1 was scheduled to launch in February of 1967. A month beforehand, they had a test, not in space, they had a test on the launch pad, a plugs out test. That means in real conditions, exactly as it would be, nothing connected to anything, on the launch pad um, in Florida. The cabin was pressurized in a pure oxygen environment, which had been used before. Super dangerous, a pure oxygen environment at a pressure slightly higher than sea level, something like 16 PSI instead of 14 PSI, which is sea level. And a spark formed in the cabin. Now a spark in a pure oxygen environment, pressurized slightly above sea level, sea level basically makes this capsule a bomb. And basically a fire, in fact, they were talking among buildings and there were things wrong. Things were not ready to go. You know, we were racing to get to the moon by the end of the decade and it wasn't working. The machinery wasn't working. And we were allowing ourselves to move forward when we weren't really ready with the machinery. And a spark with an, an exposed wire happened. The whole thing lit up. The doors were designed such that you couldn't remove them. They're in three parts. You can see the doors. Um, this, is, this is from the Kennedy Space Center. I took this picture in July. This is, these are the real doors um, that are now in a gorgeous memorial there to the Apollo 1 crew who did die in the conflagration. They're in three parts and bolted on. It took 90 seconds with two people to remove these doors. The fire destroyed the entire inside. It looked like the inside of a furnace in about 17 seconds. Um, we do believe the astronauts died of asphyxiation from poison gas that was created imminently and not from being burned, though, of course, it was like the inside of a furnace when they were found. Now, at the end of the day, you would think this might stop the space program. When astronauts reflect on this today, they say, loss of life aside, which is tragic, it was probably the best thing that could have happened to the space program because it made everybody stop and it made everybody say, we need to do this the right way. We can't accept mistakes. We can't accept shoddy work. We're putting people into space. We're sending them to the moon. And it kind of renewed an effort at excellence. Um, Gene Krantz basically had a mantra for his entire mission control team, which is a great life mantra, right? It will not fail because of me. And so that became the mantra for people. It will not fail because of me. If I see something wrong, I, you know, I will do everything I can do. I will work hard. I will put in the hours. I will report everything. I will not allow shoddy workmanship anytime anybody saw anything. And it was that spirit that seemed to characterize the remainder of the program that probably led us to a great deal of success. And so in many ways, that's how they talk about that tragic accident. The next mission here is Apollo 7. Well, what in the world happened to 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6? Right? It's the question everybody asks. They existed. There's a naming protocol that named missions are for manned missions. Again, in 1969, they are manned missions, not crewed. We'd say crewed today, C-R-E-W-E-D. And so two, three, four, five, and six were unmanned test flights of the machinery. They happened, but they don't, you know, they get different number names. They don't get designated Apollo numbers. So the next one is Apollo 7. Wally Sherrod, Don Isley, and Walt Cunningham. And what Apollo 7 is doing, they're doing a very unglamorous mission, largely to test the CSM. So they're in orbit for a very long time. Um, 
October 11th to 22nd, just about 10 days, just to test the machinery of the CSM and to demonstrate its ability to rendezvous in space with another um, spacecraft. Apollo 8 comes next. This is my favorite mission patch. This is the one I really like to talk about. Today, we'd probably have a marketing team design all the mission patches. At this time, the astronauts designed their mission patches. And um, Jim Lovell tells you that this was his idea right here. Um, the patch is a number eight. It is Apollo 8, so that's kind of cool. But it's also infinity. And infinity and eight trace a path around Earth and around the moon. And that was their mission. What they were doing is they were in the CSM launching a path around the moon and confirming that they could get to the moon, go around the moon, and get back home again. And so that's largely what that mission was. They did not have a lunar module with them, um, a little bit by design, but a little bit not. The lunar module wasn't ready. It, it, it just wasn't ready to go. And so rather than delay the program, they did this without a lunar module, sent it around the moon. These are some pictures from that mission. This is called Earthrise. And it's one of the most famous pictures taken. Um, there are many gorgeous pictures, and they're all free to the public. The archives have just been opened up. They're gorgeous. This is Earthrise. Bill Anders says he took this picture, though there's some dispute um, among the astronauts at who really took it. Um, but it is, of course, this view of Earth, You know, the way we see a moon rise. From the perspective of the moon, Earth rises in the same way. And this is the first time anyone in humanity had ever seen this. This had never been seen before. And then you have some close-ups of the moon. Some more close-ups of the moon. And this is the command module after it landed. You can see the deployed parachutes. OK. So then Apollo 9. Now, Apollo 9, this is exciting, right? We all celebrated Apollo 11. It was the big year of Apollo 11. But 2019 was actually the 50th anniversary of Apollo 9, 10, 11, and 12. 1969 was a huge year in the space program. These missions were going off every two months. And so Apollo 9 starts that in March of 1969. And what Apollo 9 is testing, it's an Earth orbital test of the first crewed lunar module, the first time we put people in the lunar module and connect it up. We start nicknaming the spacecraft here. Okay. And so the command service module, which looks like this little cone or a gumdrop, is nicknamed gumdrop. The lunar module, which looks like a big spider, is nicknamed Spider. These are very clever, super literary names. OK. And so um, they're testing the portable life support system, the spacesuit. They're checking rendezvous and docking. And they're doing an EVA, um, a spacewalk. And so these are all things that have not, not been done by Apollo before. This is the first time they're happening in Apollo. And here are some pictures. So this, this, ooh, ooh, what did I do? Ooh, there we go. Get it back if we can do that. Thank you. You were seeing the lunar module um, all. There we go. Yeah, that that we're good from there. Um, so you can see EVA. Some somebody coming out here. You can see the lunar module. You can see the command service module. Command and service. There we go. This is taken from from the perspective back here. This is the command module, the service module. This is taken from the porch of the lunar module. These are amazing pictures. I mean, just the Earth behind it, this is astonishing. And nothing like anybody had ever seen before. All right, so Apollo 10 is the dress rehearsal. Apollo 10 does every single thing Apollo 11 is going to do, with the exception of land on the moon. It gets to about 50 miles of the moon. Um, Tom Stafford, John Young, who is the, the pilot of the first space shuttle um, later in a different program, and Gene Cernan. Dress rehearsal, they do every single thing. Um, they name their lunar module Snoopy because it's going to go snoop around the moon. Now, anybody who's ever been to the Kennedy Space Center who has ever seen Snoopy with an astronaut helmet, there was a connection between Charles Schultz and NASA. Um, Snoopy at this time, you know, editorial cartoons, as today, commented on what was happening. Snoopy often commented on the space program. And Snoopy became a thing. So Snoopy was the nickname for the lunar module snooping around the moon. And who owned Snoopy? Charlie Brown. So that was what the command module became named. And then it became a thing, right? Snoopy. 
So this is Nurse D. O'Hara. Now, you know, the astronauts in this time period were very solid, strong, military, test piloty men, and they did not like the doctors. They did not like to have to ha wear all of the things they had to wear. They didn't want to be monitored. They were ripping off their, all the things that are on them to tell the doctors what's going on. They just weren't happy with any of it. But they loved Nurse O'Hara. For some reason, she was very kind, and they wanted her, on, they wanted her to be part of every mission going on. And so here she is holding a Snoopy. This is Tom Stafford um, petting Snoopy's nose for good luck as he's getting into Snoopy. And then here we go, all systems go, another Snoopy banner. And this is actually taken at the Kennedy Space Center today, the Eyes on the Stars program. Snoopy is still in an astronaut helmet at the Kennedy Space Center. It's all very fun. And this is Mission Control. And this is a picture taken here of Earthrise from <coughs> Apollo 10. And I really can't, I can look at these pictures all day long of just that Earth coming up over the moon. It is astonishing to me to think that humans were in a place where they could get this image of the moon and the Earth rising behind it. It is just absolutely gorgeous. All right, and so then here we have the lunar module headed down to within 50 feet of the moon taken from the command module. And we have the command service module picture being taken by the people on the lunar module. That's kind of fun. That's the command service module and its radio antenna. Great picture of that. And then Apollo 11, the big deal, the landing on the moon. Now, I told you that this was an iterative process. We had a number of things to solve, right? The machinery, can we get into space? Can we rendezvous in space? Can people stay alive in space? Can we get around the moon? It wasn't certain that 11 was going to be the moon landing. And so these crews, they say, were not chosen specifically. They, there was a sense that the moon landing could have been 10, 11, or 12. And many people thought it would be 12, truthfully. They thought we'd need another step in there. But it turned out that it all got figured out by 10, 10 was the dress rehearsal, and 11 is the actual landing on the moon. The only mission, really, for Apollo 11 is to land a man on the moon and get him back home safely to Earth. We didn't talk about mission types. So all of these missions have kind of letter types, and Apollo 11 is the G mission. G mission simply means man on the moon, back to Earth. Okay, we later on have um, H missions, which are a little more science oriented, and the final three missions are J missions. They're super science oriented. Well, I'll show you those when we get to them. Um, but this is the G mission, land on the moon, get back, bring some samples. Um, we're probably all very familiar. The command module was nicknamed Columbia. Um, in homage to 2001 A Space Odyssey, as well as to um, Columbia, the explorer discovering a new world. And then Eagle, is the lunar module. And of course, we probably all are very familiar with the Eagle has landed tranquility base here. And so the Eagle is the nickname for the lunar module. Great pictures from Apollo 11. These are the astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin. Not everybody knows Michael Collins. Um, Michael Collins is the guy who stayed behind in the, in the command module who brought people home. He's my favorite astronaut. Um, he's written a great book called Carrying the Fire. It is, in my estimation, the best book about the Apollo program probably ever, but certainly by an astronaut. It's super literary, and he gives a lot of dirt on the astronauts. It's very well written. Um, I am trained in literature, and I taught literature, and so I love the combination of the science and the literature. But it's a fantastic book. He's the one who stays behind, and he says his greatest fear is he's still alive he did a lot of interviews this summer um he says his greatest fear and he knew this this is his job is that they couldn't get the astronauts off the moon right if they land on the moon the descent stage has worked they climb back in if for any reason that ascent stage fails they had no backup system on the ascent stage if for any reason that fails those astronauts cannot get off the moon there's no way to go retrieve them Michael Collins has no way to land, no way to retrieve them. And so his preparation was for him to come home with or without the other two astronauts. And he said, I knew I'd be a marked man if I came home without them. And I knew that that was my job. There was nothing else I could do. And so he says, the greatest moment of the whole thing for me is watching them come back, that they got off the moon. It's very powerful. So here they are getting ready to go uh, climb in to the spacecraft. This is Michael Collins in the command service module. 
I love this. So, all right, and this tells you the geek I am. I just bought a new minivan this year, and I nicknamed it the CSM, the Command Service Module, <laughs> because it's the mothership that does all the driving and waits while other people go off and do their things, and then they come back to it. That's me. I'm waiting for all the things, and then they come back to me. Um, also, my name is Coinsmith, and so if you say Coinsmith Mobile, it works out to CSM. <laughs> and so... When we bought it, we had a very formal ceremony in which I said to the horror of my children, she's the best ship to come down the line. God bless her. Because this is what Michael Collins um, chipped in. He wrote this in the command service module. He loved Columbia and uh, left a little bit of graffiti in there, which is kind of fun. Okay. And then here is Neil Armstrong on the way. This is a gorgeous picture of the earth taken on that mission. This is the very hazy, fuzzy first step. This is Neil Armstrong stepping down onto the moon. And of course he says, um, it's one small step. He actually says for man, one giant leap for mankind. And that's a great misquote, right? What he means is it's one small step for a man. And he was asked until the day he died, did you flub that? And he's sometimes very coy about it. And he said, well, you heard it. You heard what I said. Pretty sure he meant a man. And so in space, there's no up and down. This is the lunar module on its way to the moon um, with Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong in it. It will right itself by the time it's captured in the moon's gravity. But in space, there's no up and down. It is upside down. This is Buzz Aldrin stepping down the ladder, taken by Neil Armstrong. Buzz Aldrin standing on the moon. This is one of the most famous pictures, very well staged. It's Buzz Aldrin. You can see Neil Armstrong reflected here with the flag and the whole setup in there. The famous footstep. This is um, a very famous picture of the footprint. Neil, uh, Buzz Aldrin said he took it to show um, how the sand held up to a boot print, but it's become, become an iconic picture. This is one of the most famous pictures from the Apollo group. This is called The Loneliest Man in the World. And so essentially, if you think about it, every human being, living or dead, ever is in the frame of this picture, except for Michael Collins, right? The Earth, everybody alive or dead, ever, ever. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin coming right back up from the moon. And then Michael Collins is taking the picture. The only human ever to live not in the frame of the picture. And this is the point he says, I just, I could breathe here because they were coming back to me. And so they land. Um, they get picked up by the USS Hornet. They are in contamination because we didn't want any bugs brought back from the moon. President Nixon comes to see them. If you all have not seen the new Apollo 11 movie that came out this year um, in March, it is a documentary. There's no talking over it aside from real, what they, what they did, there were people who relayed to the media in mission control what was happening. And it's only those voices that are used. And it's real footage. It is absolutely gorgeous. It is the best thing I've seen on Apollo 11. And it's brand new. It's new footage. It's, it's not been seen before. I recommend that. All right, so this is a little fun project I've been engaging on. As I read and study everything there is about Apollo, it's fun to note that they had music on the missions. And so... What did they listen to? Well, there's no list of it all, but every time I'm reading a book and an astronaut mentions a piece of music, I've put it onto my list. And so this is the list I've compiled so far. Neil Armstrong was kind of out there. He, he liked this very spacey music called Music Out of the Moon featuring a theremin, which is a funky, spacey sounding instrument that you kind of play with your hands and sound. Um, and so that's kind of fun to listen to. You hear it in a lot of sci-fi movies. And so he listened to that. He listened to the, uh, the New World Symphony, um, obviously some things with um, significance here. Um, Apollo 12, they were more of a, there was a lot of country music, there was a lot of classical music. Apollo 12 were modern music kind of guys, and so they listened to Sugar Sugar. I thought that one was fun. Um, Age of Aquarius, of course, for the Apollo 13, Aquarius was their nickname. Um, a lot of things like fly me to the moon, everybody's going to the moon, back to Galveston. So it's kind of fun. Um, I put together this summer a playlist of this, and my kids feel tortured by it because they don't like a single thing on it. But it's kind of fun to listen to periodically. It's very fun. All right. So then we're up to Apollo 12. So why go back? We did it. We landed. We got them home safely. It's all great. Why are we going to do this thing again? And so the answer is science. 
learn more, right? I heard um, Zena Cardman is a current female astronaut in, she's not flown yet, she's just about finished the training program. And somebody said to her, well, why are we gonna go back to the moon now? And uh, she said, can you imagine if after the Wright brothers flew their plane, we just kind of stopped and clapped our hands and said, we did it, yay, right? And so her answer is, we learn more, we see more, we do more. We make being in space the equivalent, the analogy is thousands of planes take off and land and we don't even think about it. And can we get to that point analogously? And some of that is here. Science is a big answer to it. Apollo 12 starts the H missions, which is deeper science, and it's also precision landing. On Apollo 11, the, um, there was a little glitch in the, the guidance that they, land, they didn't land in the place they thought they were gonna land. And so that was okay, it worked, but if you're going to be leaving things and coming back, you need to be able to land appropriately. And so part of this was, can we really figure out the math to land appropriately and can we make sure the guidance system works to get us to land in a precise way? And they were able to do that on Apollo 12. So the funky thing about Apollo 12 is that um, they were struck by lightning on the way out of Earth. And so as, they're, as the Saturn V is lifting off, the entire guidance system goes out. The astronauts who had done thousands of simulations of every possible thing that could ever go wrong saw just lights flashing up on their screens that they'd never seen before. All of them, every one, everything was out. The whole guidance platform was gone. The navigation system, out, nothing. And so, of course, they're wondering, well, what in the world to do? And curiously, somebody in mission control had seen a similar thing and knew to switch. It's actually ESC to AUX is the command they give, um, or SEC to AUX. Um, but had seen, they were resetting the guidance system. Somebody had seen in a simulation how to reset the guidance system. And so they had them do that rather than abort. And it did reset the, the navigation platform. Later on, somebody had taken a picture and they could see that they were in fact, the, the best speculation now is that they essentially created lightning. They went through highly charged clouds and created the, the they were a lightning rod. They created enough electricity current that it followed them straight down to the ground and created essentially lightning. So that's what they believe happened. But there was a big electricity strike. Um, it was all fine. They went on and did great things. Here are some pictures. So they did, I told you the H missions, they're setting up more science um, experiments. They weren't always pleased with that. These are test pilots and they wanted to test machinery and get to the moon. They weren't always happy to be doing the science things and some astronauts were louder about that than others. Um, they did do it, okay. This is the second time coming down the moon. Now, so here's a fun thing. Um, the astronauts who landed from Apollo 12, right? Neil Armstrong said, one small step for man, giant leap for mankind. Um, the astronaut coming out of Apollo 12 said, Whoopee, that might have been a small step for Neil, but it's a big one for me. And so, <laughs> Pete Conrad. And so it's, it's a funny thing to say, but he really said it to prove that the government wasn't writing the first words. Somebody said, you know the government said what Neil's saying. And he said, no, actually, we got to choose our own words. And he said, just to prove it to you, this is what I'm going to say. And so he won a bet for that. More on there. All right, so I told you Michael Collins is my favorite astronaut. He's a writer. My second favorite astronaut is Alan Bean from Apollo 12. He was a painter. And so I, I told you in, in my intro that I was born right around the time of Apollo 9, which was March 1969, which means that in addition to celebrating Apollo's 50th anniversary this year, I've had a delightful time celebrating my own 50th anniversary this year. And I find Alan Bean so inspiring because at 50 years old, he retired from being an astronaut and he took up a whole second career. He took up painting, which he'd always enjoyed and he'd taken classes when, when some of the astronauts were partying, he would be taking classes in, in Baltimore on painting. But at 50, he decided he was gonna do this full time. He went back, he studied more. He decided he was going to paint images from the moon. They looked very similar to this. Um, and he did that. He had an art, at the 40th anniversary, 10 years ago, he had an entire art show in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian, which I was delighted to see. Um, he texturizes things using 
instruments from Apollo 12, and in a couple of the famous ones, there's a little tiny bit of like dust from the inside of the vehicle in there, but it's really cool and super inspiring. All right, Apollo 13, this is one of the ones that the astronauts do not have their names on their patch. It says, Ex Luna Ciencia, from the moon, knowledge. They wanted this to be a moment about knowledge and not about themselves. I should have said this with Apollo 11 also. Those astronauts did not have their names on their patch because they wanted the landing on the moon to be about all of humanity, not about three men. Those are the two who don't have names on patches. They never made it to the Frau Mora area where they were going to land because there was an explosion inside one of their oxygen tanks and it blew away, this is a real picture, it blew away the entire side of the command service module. They lost their fuel cells. In fact, it's a successful failure, another great movie. Many people here have probably seen Apollo 13. If you've not seen that movie with Tom Hanks, do see it, it's extraordinary. But it's a successful failure because we got them home. And this is an example, it's the great quote from Gene Krantz, failure is not an option. Um, I always say failure is the only option, right? I mean, we fail, we succeed by failure. But in this instance, what he meant was we're not going to fail to get them home. We're, that's, we're gonna get these astronauts home. And this is an extraordinary story of innovation and of thinking outside the box at ways to solve complex problems using very minimal materials in space with astronauts who are frozen and sick. And so we got them home, successful failure. Interesting pictures. That's a picture, the lunar module. They, did, they were able to take this picture of Earthrise. I could look at the Earthrise pictures all day. They got close to the moon. What they did, of course, was go around the moon and come back. The Where they were in their path, they had to go all the way around the moon to get the free return traje trajectory bounce so that they could get home. Apollo 14 went back, did more science. Alan Shepard, who's the first human in space, had been grounded due to Meniere's disease, um, an ear disease, that he was able to get a surgery for so that he stopped being grounded. And he got to go up on Apollo 14. Look at some pictures. Stuart Rusa there. So this is a great picture of the ALSEP, the Lunar Science Experiment Package, the Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Package. This is the central station. This is kind of the brains of the operation. This is, um, well, it's being fueled with a little bit of plutonium, actually, radioactive plutonium. And this is the, the fuel component of it. And they're testing things like seismology of the moon. They're testing things like radiation, seismic waves, um, magnetic radiation from the sun. Those are the kinds of things being tested. Another great picture of that. These things are still on the moon when we go back. Here's a great picture of a crescent Earth, right? You think about the phases of the moon. We have phases of the Earth when you're on the moon. And so this is a, a crescent Earth. Example of a rock that they're looking at. These things are boulders. They should have a car next to it to give you scale, but it's enormous. Um, posed pictures. So Alan Shepard hid, uh, he, he was a big golfer, and he hit a golf head, nobody knew he was taking it. So this is the rock grabber thing, and he had adjusted a golf club that he hid away and took um, so that he could attach it to his rock grabber, and then he hit a golf ball on the moon. That's very exciting. He said he shanked the first one, but then the second one went really, really far, and you can really hit a golf ball pretty far on the moon. This is the real Apollo 14 command module, which is at the Kennedy Space Center. I took this picture this summer. I spared you the one of my kids in front of it, but it is there if you wanna see it. That's kind of a fun thing to do, see the command modules. Um, at Apollo 14, they were kind of jokesters. This is their mission patch. The backup crew had a joke mission patch. The backup crews, there's always a prime crew and a backup crew. The backup crews didn't really have mission patches except for this one. This was a whole team of jokesters. And so you'll notice the Roadrunner and the Coyote, which to some of you will mean something about cartoons, right? The, the Roadrunner always besting the Coyote. And so here the Coyote represents the three astronauts on the prime crew. Stuart Rusa, who had red hair, so red. Um, Edgar Mitchell, who's kind of an egghead, as they, that's their word, not mine, so he has glasses here. And Al Shepard, who, as I told you, is the first American in space, and so he's the old man of the crew with the beard. 
And so here's the, the backup crew on the moon before the prime crew saying beep, beep. So it's kind of funny. That patch was made and actually flown on the mission. Um, Al Shepard flew it on the mission and then returned it to the crew, which is kind of a fun story. All right. 15 is the first use of the lunar rover. And so they got to study more and go farther. So the science missions now, we're now into the J missions. Um, there are no I missions. I missions did something different that they ended up not doing. So we don't have any I category missions. But the J missions now are super science missions. And they're using more machinery like the lunar rover. Here's a picture of the command service module in front of the moon taken from the lunar module. That's um, Al Warden in the command module. He was the command module pilot who stayed behind for 15. You can see here a great example of the rock collection tool and the lunar buggy in the background. Pictures of the rocks. They were really studying very extensively um, rock formations. And then here is um, some of the samples when they returned. 16, Charlie Duke, the Carolina astronaut, super exciting. Um, people talk about how they enjoyed hearing his southern accent. Um, they also had a lunar rover. Ken Mattingly, who'd been bumped off of 13 for potential um, of getting the measles because he had been exposed, finally got to the moon on 16. Charlie Duke was here several months ago um, at UNC, and he told a story about how they got a little giddy on the moon, and he was jumping. He was trying to do moon Olympics to see how far you could jump. And what he did was he fell backwards onto his pack, which is his entire life support system, the way he breathes. And all he could think at that moment was, I have just killed myself. You know, I can't believe I have done this stupid thing. And so he finally got up and he tested it and he realized he could breathe. And, and then he had a little more gravitas about moving forward on the moon. Um, but they did a lot. They traveled a little farther. They did some more rock collection. Here's some more of the science experiments. So interestingly, okay, so here is their parachute and landing. Interestingly, you know, those early astronauts really were military men and test pilots and not scientists, although the missions were very science focused. There were a group of astronauts down the road who were scientists that they decided to train to fly. And so at this time, we had missions planned through Apollo 20. Apollo 17 was the last one due to budget constraints, and we had not yet flown any of our scientist astronauts at that time. And so Harrison Jack Schmidt was probably the most seasoned and most ready to fly of those. And so on Apollo 17, Apollo 17 had been a very tight crew. These, the crewmates trained together. They'd been announced years before. They were backup crews for earlier missions who then became prime crews on later missions. And um, Joe Engel was the astronaut who was supposed to be with this crew. But when it was clear that funding was ending and that there would be no more missions after Apollo 17, NASA couldn't justify on a mission so based on geology not having their geologist astronaut go. And so poor Joe Engel got bumped off the mission, never got to go to the moon, but Jack Schmidt did get to go and brought some great scientific insight they returned the most things to Earth, and very exciting to have a geologist on the moon. It was the only night launch, which here is very spectacular, especially with the clouds. And some more pictures from that mission, rock collection. More lunar rover. Um, this is kind of a fun picture. The bumper on this particular lunar rover broke. And so it was flipping up dirt and clogging everything. It was getting all of the moon dust, clogging everything here. And so they opened up a folder and duct taped it on. So that created the secondary bumper, which worked, and they could continue driving the car. Carry duct tape on the moon is the answer there. And so that's kind of the final picture. And you know, they say, we went to the moon to learn about the moon, but what we really learned about was the Earth. And so these missions are the first time we've ever seen the Earth like this, right? From that perspective, humanity had never seen this before, and it's extraordinary. And so while we went to study the moon and its geology and to learn all the things about how the Earth formed, what really, what really Americans came back with was an inspiration for this gorgeous thing, the Earth, and what, what we need to do for the Earth. 
And so I'll leave you with that. Those are the 17 missions. And we can take some questions or we can talk about it or go back or look at some more pictures. Are there any questions? Thank you. What's your favorite part? What's your favorite? Does somebody have a favorite mission? I know you do. No, I meant you, ma'am. You were smiling so big. Do you have a favorite mission? Well, the, I, I had a bridal shower the day that we landed on the moon. Did you really? <laughs> so that's always been a very special day to me for multiple reasons. That's so exciting. That's July 20th, 1969. My husband was nine days old. He just made it. I couldn't marry anybody who wasn't born when man had landed on the moon, and he just snuck it right in there. I am inspired by the Apollo story. I told you I named my child after them, but really this idea, you know, two things I'll say. Um, you saw the men who landed on the moon, right? There are maybe two dozen astronauts between Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. There are 400 thousand workers who got them there. And so those astronauts certainly are heroes. They took enormous risks. They were willing to advance civilization with their lives. But the 400,000 people working to get them there are also heroes. And that's an inspirational story to me, right? This is a moment when people came together in pursuit of a single goal and gave it their all and created things out of nothingness that we didn't have to do the impossible. And so that idea, you know, Gene Cernan, if you hear him speak, I've seen an interview with him where he says, I tell children, when I speak to children, pick up your dictionary, turn to the word impossible, and cross it out. Impossible doesn't exist. If I can walk on the moon, anything can happen. Impossible doesn't exist. And so that was so inspirational to me. I love that idea about Apollo. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering what you thought about our prospects of getting to Mars. Right. That's a great question, and I hear it a lot, right? So we've made a big announcement um, that we're going to get to Mars by the end of the 2030s. The first step of that is going back to the moon. And the idea is that we'll put a man and a woman on the moon by 2024. That's the date that's been given. Um, I think our prospects depend very heavily on our funding. And so at this time in the Apollo era, four and a half, five percent of the entire national budget was spent on getting people to the moon, right? This is an enormously funded endeavor. Now many things came out of that, jobs and all the things that were created that benefit humanity in hundreds of ways, right? Your camera sensor, <laughs> Tang. Tang was not on Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong did not like it. He was having no Tang, but other people did have Tang. But you know, if you've ever taken a picture with a camera, that's, that's the technology invented for this program, right? Glasses, your eyeglasses, your clothing, Gore-Tex, all the, those kinds of, just thousands of things. So the funding really matters. Now I will say NASA got more funding this year than it has gotten since the Apollo era but it still comes in at about half a percent of the overall budget. So in terms of ratio, it's super well funded, but not funded to the same extent, right? So I think our prospects of getting to Mars are very based on funding, and I think our funding is very based on our presidential administration. And so I did, I did say in an earlier meeting, and I wasn't, you know, I, for me, one positive thing that comes out of this moment in time is NASA funding. And I don't, you know, that's got to be kept up um, in order for it to happen. Now, a lot has to happen. So this is what they're talking about. Stopping the International Space Station, creating a gateway. All right, I have the slides. I'll show you the picture. I wasn't going to go there. But I knew somebody was going to ask the question, so I put the slides on there. Let me see if I can find the gateway. Oh, that's not it. Where's my gateway slide? All right, hold on. Oh, right there. Do you, can we get it back? I'm sorry, I went right by it. So the idea is that we'll build something like the International Space Station. Right, here it is. So we'll build something like the International Space Station outside of the moon. And so rather than sending astronauts to the space station, which is of course low Earth orbit, about 250 miles up, 
we'd get them somewhere to this gateway outside the moon, which is 250,000 miles away, and then this would become a station from which we would launch to Mars. And so again, if you think about the iterative process that got us to the moon, what are the things we needed? We needed the equipment, we needed the launch technology, we needed to figure out fuel, okay? So we'd been launching fuel the whole time. One of those missions, fuel cells were used, mixing um, hydrogen and oxygen to create water and electricity, right? So we found a way to fuel that wasn't carrying fuel. It's why Apollo 13 got shut down. Its fuel cells were damaged. The oxygen tank was gone. And so they couldn't have fuel and they were losing oxygen. So we need to invent clever, creative ways. How are we going to create fuel to get us to Mars? How are we going to create craft? How are we going to fix things when they break? Um, can we do it? I crossed impossible out of my dictionary. I think so. But what it's going to take is funding. And I think that's where the difficulty lies. What do you think? I think it'll be largely a private endeavor, a partnership. Yeah. So when we were talking about that earlier, Misha and I, he asked me, well, what do you think about SpaceX? And I said, well, bureaucracy is cumbersome, right? The early days of NASA, bureaucracy was new, and we had an effort to win the, cold, the, the space race and the Cold War. They could do things less cumbersomely in some ways. It's now very cumbersome. And I do think some combination of a fluid private system combined with a, a bigger system is probably useful. I think NASA, kind of the party line from NASA is that these kinds of partnerships are important and the way we do business now is different from the way we did business then. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm so glad you asked that, because that was the second thing I was going to say when I took this question. Okay, so, good. Why were women not chosen as astronauts and sent to the moon in the 60s? And so there, were, there was some speculation at the time that women might actually be ideal astronauts, because to send something into space, weight is everything. Weight is fuel and fuel is money, right? The lighter you are. There are no seats in the lunar module, for example, because the trip from exiting the command service module to getting to the moon was so short that it was deemed they didn't need seats, and seats were extra weight, and weight in space is the worst. You need to get as light as possible. And so there was some speculation that women would actually be better astronauts because they're smaller and they're lighter. And that really translates into billions of dollars in terms of fuel. I do see us all laughing. I clearly, you know, it, in, in general. Okay, so all to say, um, 19 women were actually tested. They went through all of Charles Lovelace's astronaut testing. Um, women who lobbied to be considered as astronauts. Um, of those 19 women, 13 of them performed better than the men who were selected as astronauts in every single test. In many instances, a lot better. In things like following the doctor's orders, that's an example they give. <laughs> they claimed that the women weren't so difficult in terms of wearing all of the things and understanding that it kind of was important to know how your heart worked in space. And so it's, th these women are called the Mercury 13. There are a number of great books written about them. If you Google the Mercury 13, um, they met every single requirement. And so why were they not chosen as astronauts? Well, the answer really is it's a product of the day, right? This was not a time when women were considered equal in many ways to men. And there were many problems connected to having women as astronauts. In that, there's a, there are whole other groups of people who would then need to be selected as astronauts, and that opened a different can of worms. You'd need to figure out bathroom situations. That was a different, you know, could we solve that? Of course we could. We did later. But, um, you know, prejudice of the 1960s is the real answer to the question. There were women who were capable and who could have done it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. 
I was actually reading about that today, because I, I don't know quite as much about the whole Russian side. I know some of it. I know the touch points. But I was reading today about a lot of the Luna um, missions, which were sent up to do a lot of observation. And I was reading about a number of the, I mean, Russia was racing as well. Russia said they weren't trying to land on the moon. Michael Collins was invited to a meeting in Paris at which there were Russian cosmonauts who were talking about learning to fly helicopters. And so the kinds of controls on a helicopter are the kinds of controls on a lunar module. And our, in fact, lunar module training system was very helicopterish. And so Michael Collins was absolutely convinced they were trying to get to the moon at that time. Um, and I think history has shown that, in fact, they were. But I think you're right. I think a there were a lot of one point that I learned today that was so interesting to me is that they weren't sharing information, right? And if we were able to share information back and forth, we might have both gotten to the moon faster and safer with less loss of life. They did have loss of life. Americans did not lo lose life in space or going or coming. We did lose life on the launch pad. And then we all know that later in the shuttle program, we, we lo we've lost life taking off and coming back in, never in space. Um, Russians did lose life in space. It's interesting if you think about what if it were collaborative and not competitive. But I think you're right. And I do think, I do think the fire, I think it made us stop. And I think it made us think through how not to do this again. Now, I was reading a different book um, today. There's another great book came out this year, um, Shoot for the Moon by James Donovan. It is an outstanding book also. It talks a little bit about, it stops at Apollo 11, but all beforehand. Um, and it, it basically said, um, no, I just lost my train of thought. We were talking about Russians and losing lives in space and how Americans had not. Um, it said that the fire, his contention is really that the fire was the best thing ever to happen to the program because it did make us stop. And it did make us vow that never again would we lose life in space. And he seemed to think that had that not happened, um, there would have been loss in space. And he was further arguing that part of the reason missions got canceled is that we didn't want to lose life in space, right? We'd done it. We did what President Kennedy said we were going to do. Let's stop because it's going to be a disaster for everybody if people die. And we were worried about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I know I'm. That's not my particular area of expertise. So I don't know quite as much about the shuttle missions, but that's. It doesn't surprise me to find that out. I think in Apollo they did not rush, and I don't. I don't know kind of know what happens beyond that. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. I need to, I need to check on that. Um, the International Space Station, of course, we would stop our presence there. And so what does that look like at a different gateway? Look. So the concept drawing definitely has presence of other areas. How that works, I don't know. So yeah, I think there's, I, we've got ESA on there. I don't know the logistics of that. Here's the thing. They're really working that out. How does a return to the moon and how does a return to Mars work? The news on that is different every two weeks right now. Um, it's true. And so things are being worked out as we speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again? I'm sorry. I know we could uh, go on about space for a long time. Uh, so. Let's thank Tina Coyne Smith again. A wonderful presentation. And we will see you uh, next month, January 14th.